This is the day the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And it is a good day to, to die to yourself. In James chapter 1. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. James chapter 1. Lord, we just want to lift you this moment, Israel. And we just ask, Lord, for wisdom, protection, and favor and everything she is going through right now and that you would constantly direct them according to your will and your way in Jesus' name. In James chapter 1 and verse 12. Can everybody hear me? Good. Would you read it with me? Blessed is the man who endures temptation for when he has been approved. Everybody say approved. approved. <laughs> he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who loved him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is what? Drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire he has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, grow, brings forth death. Do not de be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his cre creatures. In other words, in this area, he's talking something very important. He says, blessed is the person who endures the attack. <laughs> you know, there are forces of darkness that are attacking each and every one of us. Again, I want to reiterate the area that it is our responsibility to make what is unseen to become seen. Amen. And in this, he says, blessed is he who endures the force of the attack. In other words, in many areas, the open door becomes an area because your own desire or your own agenda or your secret purpose causes the attack. Does everybody got it? I want to say that again. It is your own desire, it says, because when your desire, something that you want, when your own desire or what your, your agenda or your secret purpose can cause that attack to you because it's not of God. But God allows it. Why? He allows it so that he's using it so that you can become the man and woman of God that he's called you to be. Does everybody got it? That's why it says, blessed is a man who endures temptation. No, it's blessed is a man who endures the attack. Amen. In other words, he doesn't falter. He goes through it. He says, because why? For when he has been approved, he will receive a crown of glory. In other words, everything that God is doing right now in your life, his whole purpose is it so that you are labeled as the man and woman of God? Everything. Is everybody okay? Go to Psalm 34. Psalm 34. Can we lower that one notch or something? Psalm 34, is everybody there? Now, I, I want you to know that this has nothing to do with how you feel. Well, I don't feel like a man or woman of God. It's got nothing to do with it. 
Hello. This is everything about what God is doing. See, you don't know everything God is doing. But he's doing it. And in this, he is putting you into a place so that not only his image and likeness and character can go through you, but so that you can be labeled as a man or woman of God. You know, in everything, and as a child is born, it's known as a child, children of God, right? And as we grow, we become more and more mature. Not that anybody ever really makes the, you know, hello. But we are maturing, we are growing, and all of these things that is happening in our life is opportunities to grow. But in this, God is using these things so that you become the man and woman of God that he has called you to be. So that you can fit perfectly in the place. And not every place is permanent. Hello. But he'll keep you there until you change to fit that place. Then he moves you to another place. Or he grows you in that place. Is everybody okay? So everything that you're going through is so that you can become labeled the man and woman of God that he has called you to be. In Psalm 34 and verse 15, would you read it with me? It says, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their what? It didn't say his ears are open to their joy. It says his ears are open to their what? Cry. In other words, you know, so many people think that once you become a believer, everything should go smooth and easy. Wrong. This is where things begin to happen. And in this process, you are going to have pain. And you will have pain till the day you die. Hello. Why? Because you are always going through something. It doesn't stop. Amen. You know, it's amazing. People wonder, well, when is this going to stop? It won't. <laughs> it doesn't. The word says that we're groaning. We're groaning inside. Not to be unclothed, but more clothed with the glory of God. Why? Because you're an eternal being. And you're in a temporary realm. You don't even belong here, man. You belong into another realm. You came from him, and you want to go back to him. See, you came from the presence of God already. When you begin to understand it, you've come from the presence of God. Now you want to get back to the presence of God, but by the all the time you've been here, the enemy has been putting things in your path to try to fulfill the presence of God or replace the presence of God. Money, sex, this, that, sex, drugs, rock and roll, you name it. Anything to prevent you from truly finding out the truth of the presence of God and the reality that that's where you came from and that's where you want to be. But see, the enemy lies. The word says the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came to bring life and life more abundantly. Why? Listen, he didn't come to bring you a new life. He came to restore the life that you were supposed to have. That's what's called redemption. That's what's called salvation. To salvage. Amen? Amen. See, so you really don't belong in this realm. This is not our home. We've come from the presence of God and we want to get back to the presence of God. That's, what we're, that's why when we praise and worship, something begins to happen. It's almost like, oh, whoa, peace. Why? Because you're home. Amen. You're home. And, and that's what's so important about learning how to press all the way in and coming out of the outer court and getting into the holy place. And having the veil open up where you get into the Holy of Holies because that's home, man. That's where you belong. That's where you came from and that's where you want to go back to. Amen? And in verse 15 again, it says, the, Lord, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous do what? Sounds like a lot of cries from the righteous. Why? You know why? They're in pain. They are suffering. 
And it's not about just being persecuted or tormented. It's within. Because part of that is that groaning, that suffering of change. Groaning, suffering, pain. That's within. It's not an outward type of thing. It's an inward type of thing. It's something you're constantly fighting with and struggling with all the time, trying to sever these areas of thoughts, these areas of the heart, these areas of anger, these areas, all of these things that we're constantly overcoming. But it's, they never seem to go away until we're back in the presence of God. Other than that, we're overcoming them. So don't think you're crazy, hello, that you have to go through all of this. But see, God is allowing these things to happen to mold you. <laughs> For much is given, much is required. The righteous cry out, and the Lord does what? He hears and delivers them out of all of their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit. So sometimes when God wants to get close to you and you don't want to get close to him, stuff happens. Hello. Stuff happens to what? You finally get a broken spirit. You get a, bro a contrite heart to him. You finally get out to that place where you have to cry out to God. Oh, Lord, where are you? That's what he's been waiting for. <laughs> he's just been wanting to get closer to you, but you couldn't. He couldn't. But now when that heart changes, he comes closer. Is everybody with me? It says, verse 19, many the, are the afflictions of the righteous. Afflictions, those are pains and sufferings. There are many of the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. He guards all of his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. But the Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. Many afflictions, that's temptation attacks of the forces of evil, rejections, fears, loneliness, all of those areas. But the Bible says the Lord delivers us out of all of them. We are passing through these seasons. Are you listening? We go through these seasons where God allows certain things to happen to us so he can mold us. Does everybody get this? He hears the cries. He looks for the broken heart to draw near because of the making. He's making you into that man of God. He's making you into that woman of God. But see, we have that carnal peanut brain that says, how? Why? When? See, we got a, a little kernel brain wants to know every little thing God's doing. And let me tell you something. He is not going to tell you. So I want you to know this right now. He is not going to tell you. Everybody going to say, he's not going to tell me. He's going to want you to trust him. He is not going to tell you how it's happening. I'm sorry. I have searched and the result was zip I'm not going to tell you guy you must trust me but is there anything I can do to cooperate in this circumstance maybe I can help you no You know, can you imagine Noah? Noah? Yes, Lord. Uh, I want you to make an ark. An ark. Okay. What's an ark? Well, it's a boat. Well, well, well what's a boat? Well, it's going to rain. 
40 days. What's rain? You know, Noah didn't know anything. But he obeyed, didn't he? And all of his neighbors mocked him, didn't they? But in his suffering, did man, Noah become a man of God? Amen. How about Job? Amen. There isn't one person in this Bible who didn't suffer, who did not become a man or woman of God. Amen. Not one. There isn't anyone that just buzzed through it, did the backstroke, to become the man and woman of God. No one. But why does it always happen to me? Because you asked for it. <laughs> Lord, I want to know your ways. I want to please you. Teach me. Okay. Wait a minute. Not that way. Can I, can I tell you how it... I really... Make my request known and how it should be done. No. He doesn't answer those requests. He knows what you need and what he's preparing you for. Do you understand? Amen. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5. Oh, hallelujah. 1 Peter chapter 5. We've read this over and over. And I'm telling you, did you ever notice that when you read something and, you, about, and the Holy Spirit just brings a whole new revelation over it again? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. Would you read it with me? Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may what? That he may what? Exalt you when? In due time. Is time associated with season? Yes. How about exalt? Do you think that maybe that might mean that he's calling you the man and woman of God? That he may exalt you? That others may know that his hand is upon you? Hello? That you have his seal of approval? Hello? Now, a lot of people try to put their own seal on. You know, it's like one of those kids that tattoo themselves with the water tattoo. It always washes off when they get wetter, you know. Those are not the seals of God. The seals of God come with pain and suffering and seasons. I said seasons, not a season. Seasons. You know, all the men and women of God, they just, this just didn't get zapped and became the man and woman of God. Hello. Look at Jacob became Israel. Look at King David. He was not the man of God until he went through all kinds of stuff. And look at the sufferings he did. Amen? And he fell into fornication. Solomon, same way. All these men and women of God had to go through sufferings and pain. Everyone. I'm not talking about self-inflicting. Hello. I'm talking about things that God allows to happen in our life so that we can be approved, sealed, and labeled as his servant. Is everybody okay? It says what? Verse 7. Casting your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now, if the devil is always overcoming an individual and they're always breaking covenant, obviously God cannot approve that individual, can he? But he's going to use that and hope that that individual will finally cooperate all the way so he can seal them with his approval and label them as the man and woman of God. It says, verse 9, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same what? Same what? I'm sorry. Sufferings. Mm. Are experienced only by yourself. Oh. They're experienced by who? Your brotherhood in the what? In the world. 
Everybody goes through it. So when the devil says, aren't you alone? Aren't you the only one? I can't believe you did that. Oh, yes. Everyone in this room has gone through this. Not only once, but you're going to go through it many more times. <laughs> Until you are sealed, approved, and labeled. So everybody got it. And that's just for one position. Then you go through it again for the other position. Then you go through it again for the... It don't stop until you hit home. Has everybody got it? It doesn't stop. Exalt you, make you into the man and woman of God. Why? Through suffering. Suffering, pain, persecution, affliction. That's how he molds you. But look at number 10. But may the God of all grace who called us to his what? Eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After you have what? After you have suffered a while. Welcome to the training ground. Perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Has everybody got this? Is everybody okay? Psalm 119. Psalm 119. You know, everybody understands that you're your worst enemy, right? You know, if the devil ain't attacking you, you are. <laughs> you know, but the things that we say, you know, things that at the degree, we self-impose all this stuff on us. Oh, man, I'll never get this. Hello. Oh, man, I'll... In this, we, mean, we need to change certain things. And that's what God is, that's why we're going through things until certain things change. Things that come out of our mouth, things that, you know, so forth. And I was playing tennis the other day and, and I got my butt kicked on the first set. And then the Second set wasn't so painful. And, and I was like, you know, I wanted to say, man, I really stink. <laughs> Maybe I ought to take up another sport. <laughs> and the Lord said, do not say that. And I'm telling you, I heard him as clear as day. He said, when you think about saying that you stink, I want you to say, I'm learning. I'm learning. So I was playing and I'm getting really intense in this and I'm, you know, we're a tie score and, and, I'm, and, and this shot comes by and I went, oh, I can't believe I missed that. Man, I, I'm learning. I'm learning. And I'm just over there shaking, waiting for the ball to come and to serve. And I go, I'm learning. I'm learning. It's the first time I ever beat this person in a set. And I actually won my first set with this person. Because I kept saying, I'm learning. I'm learning. I'm learning. Not I stink. I'm learning. Not I'm bad. I'm learning. Not, not oh, how can anybody forgive me? I'm learning. Well, well what, what about this guilt and count? No, I'm learning. I'm learning. Jesus said, come to me and learn from me. Amen? I'm learning. So no matter what the enemy tries to use you to bring in self-opposed label, you're learning. I'm learning. I'm learning. Wow, you're learning to be the man and woman of God. Amen? You're learning. Is everybody okay? Yeah. Psalm 119, verse 65. Oh, hallelujah. Let's read it. Look at, now look at these. These are Psalms from David. Now, now you know, I mean, he went through a lot of stuff, man. And now look at some of these prayers he prays. 
You have dealt with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I what? I went astray, but now I kept your word. In other words, <laughs> he got afflicted because he what? Went astray. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. The proud have forged a lie against me. Anybody ever lie against you? But I will keep your precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in your law. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. So, see, he first was crying out about being afflicted, wasn't he? You have dealt bountifully with me. You have dealt with me. Please teach me so that I don't have to go through this again. Amen. <laughs> and then at the end he says, it was good that I was afflicted. Why? Because he learned something. Is everybody okay? He acknowledged the Lord was doing something with him to fashion him into the man of God. Why? He was keeping him near. Has everybody got that? In Psalm 27. Is everybody okay? You're all quiet right now. Psalm 27. In verse 11. Oh, this is good. Read this with me. Is everybody there? Teach me your way, O oh Lord. In other words, here he goes. Teach me, Lord. See, he cries out, teach me, after he's been usually afflicted. Okay, now, teach me the right way to do this. Teach me your way, O oh Lord, and lead me in the smooth path because of my enemies. Why? Because he was just going through a lot of stuff. Obviously, it wasn't a smooth path. But he wanted a smooth path this time. Because of what he's been going through. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries. For false witnesses have risen against me. And such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen your heart. Wait on the Lord. Wow. Wow. He was saying false witnesses against him. He kept going, Lord, I'm being persecuted by people. I'm tired of people. Teach me another way. Isn't there something else I can do that's a little bit easier than this? I, I need a smoother way, an easier way. Because of the pain that I go through. This is what David was crying out. The pain that I have to put up with. The pain that I'm going through. You know, everybody wants to get to the top. But there really isn't a top. There's no such thing as the top. Hello? There's only one top. <laughs> but people want to get in ministry and get in authority right away and everything. And they have no idea when they get there what happens. Because most of the time they want to run. And if you don't allow God to place you, but mold you, position you, and approve you, before you get there, you don't last there. Amen. And it usually brings shame to the name of the Lord. Amen. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. Hallelujah. Verse 19. Is everybody there? Let's read it. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having the seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. 
But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, and prepared for what? Every good work. So we see here that we are, these vessels of honor are known as men and women of God. Has everybody got it? And it says, cleanse from the past. In other words, the things of the old. So that his character can take over in every area. So you are going to have to go through pain, suffering, trials, tribulations. That's why the word says, count them as joy. So that you can be molded. So that you can be sealed. So that you can be approved. And so you can be labeled. Is everybody with me? Go to the next chapter. Chapter 3 and verse 12. All right, everybody read it. Yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will... Say what? <laughs> suffer. Everybody wants to live godly? Godly is going to suffer persecution? Yes. Yes. So you can allow it to work or you can run from it. But I'm telling you, you'll never escape it. Because torment will always follow you. So anyone who wants to live godly is going to, get, going to suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving in what? Being deceived. But you, want, you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good. Or the man and woman of God be thoroughly equipped. So you're going to suffer pain. It's within the body. Within. Has everybody got it? It's within. See, Jesus knows what you're going through, doesn't he? He's allowing this molding to happen. He is allowing it to happen. Are you listening? Now, how many times have you all said, where are you, Lord? What am I doing wrong? Not every time that something happens is because you're doing wrong. Hello. How about confusion? Man, I just don't know which way to go or what decision to do. That's all a part of it. You know, many people get uh, confusion can, can take you captive. But it's only temporary. You'll get through that season if you allow God to do it and quit fighting and start Submitting. Has everybody got it? Most of the time we fight against God and the things he's molding us with. All men and women of God will have pain. How many times have you ever said to the Lord, Lord, why have you forgotten me? Or, Lord, have you forgotten me? I'm so lonely. I don't get this. Man, I just, this don't feel right. <laughs> just this don't I, I don't man this don't feel good at all Lord this can't be you it's me I'm molding you I'm allowing you to suffer now I'm not talking about self inflicted things has everybody got it I mean I've seen some strange individuals that wear religious uniforms and have made proclamations saying that I've taken a vow of poverty. Well, you're an idiot. God didn't require a vow of pro poverty. He said, I want you to prosper, didn't he? It's amazing to me, I've taken a vow of poverty. Yeah, like that's going to expand the kingdom of God. That's going to feed the hungry. Hello, what are you going to do, give him a shoe to eat? You know, there's a lot of goofy stuff out there where that's called, you know, self-religious promotional stuff. 
God is not interested in sacrifice. He's interested in obedience. Amen. 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 Ephesians 5. Oh, hallelujah. In verse 1. Is everybody there? Ephesians 5, verse 1. Would you read it with me? Therefore be what? Imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and giving himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanliness or covetousness let it not even be named among you as fitting for saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting. Which are not fitting, but rather giving thanks. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, or covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but you are now light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And they have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but what? Rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Now, I want you to understand something in all of this, that God utilizes things in our life to expose things in our life, doesn't he? There are tools he uses to expose us. Tools of exposure. Now, he uses people, places, and things to expose things, doesn't he? Now, remember, he's not exposing things because of condemnation. He's exposing things because of molding. See, so many people, the first thing that they go through when something gets exposed in their life is guilt, condemnation, Woe is me, I'm alone, I'll never make it. Dun -dun 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 -dun. Hello. That's not God. God exposes things in your life because he's molding you, because he's preparing you. So he can seal you, approve you, and label you. Do you understand that? See, but we have this tendency that we've been brought up with that we're bad. Were you bad than you? We're not bad. We don't belong in this realm. We have a hard time in this realm. Has everybody got it? Because we're always fighting to try and get home. But so many times we're fighting for what we don't even know what we're fighting for. But you're fighting to get home. Because you don't belong here. So in this, God begins to use tools of exposure. And he'll use people, places, and things. But he also uses other things. Would you turn to 2 Corinthians 7? Is everybody okay? Second Corinthians 7 and verse 8. Everybody there? Let's read it. For even if I made you sorry or sorrow with my letter, I did not regret it. Though I did regret it, for I perceived that some that the same epistle made you sorrow or sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to what? repentance for you were made sorry in godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing so in other words 
you got caught. <laughs> you got exposed. And maybe you didn't even realize what you're doing or maybe you did realize what you're doing. But there's that sorrow that is godly that leads to repentance and there's that sorrow that is worldly that does not lead to repentance. Go to verse 10. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces what? Death. So sometimes that sorrow that's within you is painful, isn't it? It's painful. It's within. It's that pain we go through. The things that we've promised and we couldn't fulfill. Amen? The things that we know we've hurt individuals. And, and because of the things that we've done, we have uh, sorrow in us. We have suffering in us and pain. Things that we know that if we done, made other choices, things wouldn't have gone that way. Amen? But those are all a part, of course, of everything working to the good. That's a part of that suffering where God is actually getting you to a place of approval. Approval. Remember, there isn't one man and woman of God in this Bible that tiptoed through the tulips. Hello? Or swam across the ocean. Real easy. Every one of them went through suffering and pain and torment and even torture. Every one of them. Has everybody got it? Good. So we are to imitate God, become the man and woman of God, exposing those things of darkness by the light of truth. Go to Luke 16. I want to share one of the tools that God uses. And I believe it's the number one tool that he uses. Now I'm, you know, sometimes some people it's a little bit different, but I believe this is the number one tool. Luke 16. Oh, hallelujah. The number one tool I really believe the Lord uses is in verse 13. Has everybody got it? Is everybody there? Let's read it together. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. I believe that money is the number one tool God uses to expose where we're at. He exposes the heart with that. I believe truly that money is the number one thing that will expose the heart of an individual and where they're at. Is everybody okay? Go to 1 Timothy 6. <clears throat> Why? Because money is associated with the God of this world. That's how God, that's how the God of this world, Satan's kingdom, manipulates people, uses people, directs people. Because many people, money is God to them. Is everybody all right? Come on, you know how you get when you're short on your check? Hello. You know how you get when you don't have enough money to pay your rent? You know how you get when there's you had your hidden agenda or purpose that you wanted to do with some money and it didn't fall according to your way. An unexpected bill came across and went, oh, what am I going to do now? Die. Money will be the number one thing, I, number one tool I believe God uses to expose the heart of us. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10. 
For the love of money is a what? Root of all kinds of evil. For which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Wow. Pierced themselves. In other words, because they went astray. You know, in a, in a, uh, an addiction program, which I really believe is one of the toughest ministries, we deal with a lot of demonic forces. And the enemy, because of where people have been, you know, and, and, in other words, the more things you've done in your life, the more the devil has access to you. Amen? So, being an, an ex-addict myself, the enemy has more access to me than somebody who hasn't been and done the things I've done. And one of the things is, of course, being an addict, not only was the dope your God, but without the money, hello, you couldn't do, get what you wanted to get. Unless you stole or did something else and put your life more in danger. So in that, there's always that connection with money that we must be very careful with. We can never allow money to rule us. We should have dominion over money. Has everybody got it? In other words, what God is going to do, he will provide. If he's called you to do something, he's going to provide it. Amen? And we talked last week about making it happen and waiting, letting it happen. You know? I'm telling you, money can move a person right out of the presence of God, move them right out of the will of God, and move them right to hell. And then they lose the money anyways because you can't buy nothing there. You can't buy your way out. I've seen money move people out into destruction and out of the will of God and go right back where they started from. They get that first check and book, poof, they're gone. And they don't realize that they just stole from God like God needs it. But it's the attitude and the motive behind it. You know, remember, God has always given us, he's providing us something to sow, isn't he? See, money has a tendency to always, it's got everybody's own face on it. When you open that dollar bill or whatever, there's your face. Oh my God, it's mine. It's got the picture of you on it. Whether it's a 10, 20, 50, or 100. <laughs> See, you need to erase that picture and put Jesus on there. It needs to be Jesus money. <laughs> but money is really the number one tool that I have seen expose an individual and the secret agendas, secret purposes of the heart and move people out of the way. You know, sometimes it's just like, man, don't give me any money. You know, and after I'd gotten saved and reconciled, my wife and I gotten back together, I didn't want anything. I mean, and she used to give me an allowance of 20 bucks a week, which I used to give away. Because I didn't care. I knew how it affected me then, and I never wanted it to try to run my life again. I actually respected money now in the area of what it can do to me. Does everybody get this? Look at how many people have won the lottery and are dead or in jail. I mean, they spent millions of dollars and still did other things. And they thought, yes, that's all I need is money. Come on. Every one of us, when we were brought up in the world, always figured that if we had enough money, everything would be okay. Even Trump still thinks that. If he can get enough money, everything will be okay. The guy's worth a gazillion bucks, and he still needs to have more money. The problem is, is he's not going to be able to spend it where he's going. Unless he gets right. No sowing in the kingdom whatsoever. All of that money and everything is produced for the kingdom of darkness, not the kingdom of light. Money. The root, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. You cannot allow money to cause you fear 
who to cause you to move when it's not God's time. Does everybody get this? There's nothing wrong with working. There's nothing wrong with doing stuff and whatever. There's nothing wrong with purchasing things. But you never allow money to run your life. Now, I'm not telling you to go out and spend all your money so it doesn't run your life. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of teachings out there about money and some of them I don't agree with. Because a lot of their teachings would be messed up by Jesus theology. <laughs> they take the word out of context. And they got all of these things all set in order. This is what you got to do with your money. Well, what about the guy Jesus said, look, go sell everything. <laughs> well, that bowl their whole theology, how you, which you, how you need to operate your money. When Jesus said to him, go sell everything you have and then follow me. See, because people put their trust in money. That's why. Somebody got it. Instead of putting their trust in the Lord. Is everybody okay? So I really believe the number one tool for exposure that God uses is money. Go to John 2. John chapter 2. Praise God. John chapter 2. Is everybody there? Verse, uh, eh, let's see. Verse 13. Would you read it with me? Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them out of the temple with the sheep and oxen and poured out the, cha the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Now I want you to understand that he's also not only talking about the physical, he's talking about you and me. You and me. One of the things that Jesus begins to do is start kicking over your tables in this temple. And that's where a lot of pain, that's where things, why? Because he's exposing things. Remember, he's not exposing things to condemn you. He's exposing things to mold you. Has everybody got it? That's why. He's exposing things. Why? So he can approve you. He loves you unconditionally. That's everybody got it. He, he, I, man, he gave his life for me and you. So he's going to kick over the tables in your life, in your heart, expose it, so he can approve you. So he can seal you. And so he can label you. Go to 2 Kings 5. Second Kings chapter 5. Everybody okay? Don't put your hands in your pockets to check out see how much money you have now, okay? Oh, God, no. <laughs> in verse 1, 2 Kings 5. Would you read it with me? Now, Naam, a commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel, and she waited on Naam's wife. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who was in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. 
And Nain went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand she uh, shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, now be advised when this letter comes to you that I have sent Nahum my servant to you that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. So it was when Elijah the man of God heard that the king of Israel had torn the clothes, that he went to see the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Then Nahum went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elijah's house. And Elijah sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Nam, because of, became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Wrong. Are not the uh, Abana and the uh, Farpur, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage, and his servants came. The servants came near to him and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more than when he says to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped seven times in a Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little, a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God and all his aides and came and stood before him and said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in, the, in all the earth except in Israel. Now therefore, please take a gift from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he, and he urged him to take it, but he refused. So Nahum said, Then if not, please let your servant be given two mold loads of earth, for your servant will no longer offer either burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. Yet in this thing, may the Lord pardon your servant when my master goes into the temple in Ramon to worship there. And he leans on my hand and I bow down in the temple of Ramon. When I bow down in the temple of Ramon, may the Lord please pardon your servant in this thing. Then he said to him, go in peace. So he departed from him in a short distance. But Gehazah, the servant of Elijah, the man of God said, look, my master has spared Nahum the Syria while not receiving from his hands what he brought, but as the Lord lives, I will run after him and take something from him. So Gehazah pursued Nahum. When Nahum saw him running after him, he got down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, All is well. My master has sent me. Look what money did already cause him to what? Lie. He sent me, saying, Indeed, just now two young men of the sons of the prophets have come to me from the mountains of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of garments. So Nahum said, Please take two talents. And he urged him and bound the two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garments and handed them to the two of his servants. And they carried them on ahead to him. When he came to the uh, citadel, he took them from their hand and he stored them away in his house. Then he let the men go and they departed. Now he went in and stood before his master. Elijah said to him, Where did you go, Gehazah? And he said, Your servant did not go anywhere. 
Man, he's getting deeper and deeper. Then he said to him, Did not my heart go with you when the man turned back from his chariot to meet you? Is it time to receive money and to receive clothing, olive groves and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male and female servants? Therefore the leprosy of Nahum shall cling to you and your descendants forever. And he went out from his presence, leprous, as white as snow. Eventually he died. Now I want you to understand something very important here. Because he was supposed to receive the anointing passed down from Elijah. And he died. And, anoint, and Elijah died with the anointing also. And it was never passed through. That's a whole other teaching. You can go to anointed bones one and two. So I want you to see this is the area where money, even the man of God, living with Elijah, seeing all of these wonderful things and how money misled him, pulled him right out. See, there are many people who follow provision instead of the Lord. And you must be very careful of that. Do not follow provision. You follow the Lord. Amen? Go to First uh, Peter chapter 1. Hallelujah. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former what? Lust as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like what? Silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of the Lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundations of the earth, but was manifested in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. I really truly believe also that the second area that God, the second tool that God uses to expose is lust. Now we know he uses people, doesn't he? And in this lust, and it's not just lust over another individual. It's lust over things and idolatry and stuff like that and, and materialism. People who have lusts over these things. I believe God uses these tools to expose our heart in this area of lust. Is everybody okay? And James 4, verse 1. You know, did you ever wonder why God put, allowed Satan to be in, in, in the garden? And what was he doing? He, he, he tempted everybody, what? Lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and pride of life, didn't he? Now, he was allowed in that garden, not only because he had a right to be there, but he was allowed in that garden so that God can utilize them to train up Adam and Eve. Has everybody got it? See, but he never wanted them to become good and evil he wanted them to know what good and evil was but never become it so they weren't supposed to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil they were just supposed to learn from it without eating it has everybody got this praise god and james 4 and verse 1 where do wars and fights come from among you do they not come from your desires for pleasure that warn your members you lust and do not have you murder and covenant and cannot obtain you fight and war yet you do not have because you do not ask and when you ask you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures 
adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. So we see that there's fornication, adultery, idols, materialism, so forth. Go to James 1 while we're here. And I truly believe that the, num uh, um, the other tool that God uses, now this may sound strange to you, but it's really not strange. It's called your tongue. He uses your own tongue to expose us. In verse 26, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow. Ver chapter 1 and verse 26. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Oh, I'm sorry. Hello. And verse 26. If anyone among you thinks he's religious and does not what? Bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So I really believe that God uses these three years. The number one thing is money. The number two is lust. And the number three is our own tongue. John 15. Hallelujah. John 15. Tools of exposure. And we know he uses other things, doesn't he? God uses everything available. <laughs> John 15 and 16. Somewhere around there. What does it say? You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you that you love one another. So he said, you didn't choose him, he chose you. Amen? Go to Acts 9. Say, God chose me to mold me, to approve me, to seal me, and to label me. Glory. Oh, hallelujah. In verse 15. Would you read it with me? But the Lord said to me, everybody say that. But the Lord said to me, go for he is, I am a chosen vessel. He is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings and children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must what? Suffer for what? My name's sake. My name's sake. See, God has chosen you to go before kings, to go before others, that you would suffer things. Why? Because he's going to seal you, approve you, and label you. Amen? And I'm going to close it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1. In verse 26. So you mean everything I'm going through right now is working to the good and it's so I can get approved and sealed and labeled? Yes. For you see your calling, verse 26, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble were called. 
But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us the wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Amen. So everybody got it. So you know why you're going through everything. Good. Make sure you go through it. Don't get stuck in it. You keep going through Amen. Don't look behind, behind you. Don't try to figure it out. Keep going. Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. I pray a blessing over each and every one here tonight, Father. And I ask, Lord, that you continue to give us the strength to endure. That we may press through. All the way through. Knowing that you have the last word and that you see it all. Nothing's hidden from you. Lord, any area of stumbling, that we've afflicted our own selves, we repent. But Lord, we sever ourselves from every emotional attachment of people, places, and things, and all idols, that it be you who molds us. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Praise God.